Welcome to video number 79 in our series on tensor calculus. In this video, we'll show how the curvature tensor can be used to derive the values of the mean curvature and the Gaussian curvature that we defined in the last video. You'll remember from video 71 that our surface covariant basis vector is not metronilic. Its covariant derivative is not equal to zero, but it's equal to this expression right here. Well, um, let's remind ourselves of the basic definition of our basis vector. Our basis vector S alpha is uh, simply equal to the partial derivative of our position vector R with respect to the corresponding coordinate value S alpha. Well, this in turn is equal to the covariant derivative with respect to alpha of our position vector. Now, this is true because uh, r is an invariant expression. It has no free indexes. You'll remember if we're going to expand out a covariant derivative, we start by taking the partial derivative, and then we add a term with the Christoffel symbol for each of the free indexes. Well, there are no free indexes, so there are no terms with the Christoffel symbol. So this relationship, the equality of the covariant derivative with the partial derivative is true of any object that has no free indexes. It's true of vectors like this, or scalar functions, or any tensor that is fully contracted. All right, well, let's use this expression in place of our basis vector. And what we'll have is the covariant derivative with respect to beta of this expression, the covariant derivative with respect to alpha of the position vector r, and that's equal to what's on the right side here, b alpha beta times our normal vector in hat. Okay, well now let's raise the alpha index in both of these positions, and of course we do that by contracting with the contravariant metric tensor. And since that is metronilic with respect to the covariant derivative, then it applies across these operations without any problem. So we can raise the alpha index. We'll have the covariant derivative with respect to beta of the contravariant derivative of our position vector r. And on the right side, we have b alpha beta, but alpha is in the upper position this time. All right, and now I want to form a contraction by renaming beta to alpha. So we'll have the covariant derivative with respect to alpha of the contravariant derivative with respect to alpha of our position vector r equaling to b alpha alpha, again a full contraction, times our normal vector in hat. Well, surely you recognize uh, this combination of operators here as just the Laplacian. So this can also be expressed this way. It is the Laplacian operator of our position vector r. Now, this is a very important relationship. It tells us that the Laplacian of our position vector is equal to this expression here, which we define as the curvature normal. Now, what jumps out at us immediately here is that the curvature tensor is related to our position vector by means of a second order derivative. Now, you'll remember a couple of videos ago, we established that the first derivative of our position vector tells us something about the direction of the curve gives us a unit vector that's tangent to the curve at every point. But the second derivative gives us information about how fast that uh, direction of that unit vector is changing. In other words, it gives us information about the curvature of our curve. Well, it shouldn't be surprising then that the information about curvature of our surface, which is this uh, curvature tensor right here, is related to our position vector by means of a second order derivative. All right, well, let's do one other thing. Let's take this expression right here, uh, 
dot both sides of this with the normal vector in hat in order to isolate our curvature tensor on one side. So uh, in the process, I will switch sides of the equation. So we're going to have B alpha beta. And when we dot this side with n hat, n hat dotted with itself is 1, so that isolates this uh, tensor on one side. And then that's equal to all of this, which is the covariant derivative with respect to beta of the contravariant derivative of our position vector dotted with our normal vector n hat. Now, what this gives us is yet another form in which we can express our curvature tensor in explicit terms. We have our curvature tensor here as a function of all of this stuff over here. Now, this form is not particularly useful in actually evaluating our curvature tensor, but it does give us some very uh, interesting and important geometric insight. Notice that uh, our curvature tensor components here, there'll be four of them. Alpha varies from 1 and 2, and beta is 1 or 2. So there are going to be four components. And uh, what those four components are, are um, illustrated by this combination here. If alpha and beta are the same, if they're both 1 or they're both 2, then this operation here is roughly equivalent to the second derivative, the second partial, of r with respect to one or the other of the two variables, s1 or s2. But if alpha and beta are different, if they're 1 and 2, for example, then this will represent a mixed derivative, a second partial derivative of r with respect to 1 and then 2, or 2 and then 1. So this gives us the four possible combinations of second-order derivatives with respect to our two surface coordinates. Now, of course, uh, this part of it here is going to be a vector, but when we dot it with the normal, that's going to produce a scalar value. So this whole operation will give us a set of four scalar components for our curvature tensor. Well, what I want to do now is to use this form to relate what we have here to the four possible second-order partial derivatives that we were working with in the last video. To do so, I've organized our partial derivatives from the previous video into the form of a 2 by 2 matrix. Now, this is how we would organize the information if we were working with linear algebra. Now, I do this because I want you to see how consistent this structure is with our curvature tensor. In both cases, we have a 2 by 2 matrix, and the components of the matrices are basically, logically, the same thing. For example, here I've got a second partial derivative with respect to a single variable u. Well, this is uh, the same thing, in effect, in tensor calculus. In tensor calculus, of course, we use the covariant derivative instead of the partial derivative. But this is uh, a second partial derivative of, of our position vector here with respect to s1. Well, the same thing is true here. It's a second partial with respect to a different variable, as is this. And then these other terms here are mixed derivatives. They involve the partial derivative with respect to one variable and then the other. So it's the, the mixed partials that we see here. All right, well, what I want to tell you is that each of these two forms carries exactly the same information concerning the curvature of our surface. We're not in a position to prove that at the moment, but uh, given the consistency of the structures, it's a very reasonable thing to conjecture. So let's just take that as a given at this point and move on to see where it takes us. In the previous video, we developed the concept of the mean curvature. And we said that uh, the mean curvature is just the sum of this component and this component, the two partial derivatives with respect to each of the variables one at a time. Add them together, we get what's called the mean curvature. Well, in the jargon of linear algebra, and in this structure you see up here, this sum of elements would be what we call the trace. The trace is the sum of the diagonal elements in our matrix. So when we add these two together, we get the trace, and the trace is a known invariant in linear algebra. So uh, that's what we get here.
Well, on this side over here, we have something similar. We don't call it the trace, but it's the equivalent. And that equivalent is that we form a contraction. And the contraction of our curvature tensor is that of making the two indexes the same. And of course, a contraction means a summation. This is an implied summation. And uh, if we expand it out, this simply means B11 plus B22. And if you look at the structure that we've uh, organized this in, B11 is this element and this element. We're adding them together. So the two objects are absolutely the same. It's the sum of the diagonal elements that yields this expression. And here, um, we didn't prove that the trace is invariant, but we could do so by applying a, a rotational transformation of our coordinate system in linear algebra. But over here, we already know that we have an invariant because we know we started with a tensor, and any full contraction of a tensor gives us an invariant. So we don't have anything to prove over here. We know this is an invariant. Well, these two yield exactly the same value. This is just the way that you would express the um, mean curvature using our curvature tensor. It's a natural fallout of the structure of the curvature tensor itself. All right. Um, another thing we learned in the previous video was that we had this invariant. We discovered that uh, if we multiply these two terms together and subtract the square of this term, we get the Gaussian curvature. And um, it's an invariant expression. doesn't matter which direction our coordinates were oriented. We'd always get the same value if we applied this formula. Well, this formula is just the product of these elements minus the product of these elements. This one and this one are equal. So this squared term is just the product of these uh, terms here. So what we really have here is just the value of the determinant of this matrix right up here. Well, in tensor calculus, we have the equivalent, and that is just the determinant of our curvature tensor. So the determinant of our curvature tensor, which we express this way with two dots in the bars like this, is just the product of these elements, B11 times B22, minus the product of these elements, which is B12 times B21. And again, if you go back to, what is it, video number 46, that's where we demonstrated that the determinant of a um, tensor in tensor calculus is an invariant if the indices are, are in the upper and lower position, as long as one index is upper and one is lower, then its determinant will be an invariant scalar value. So again, we don't have to prove that this is invariant. We know this directly from the nature of, of a tensor. The determinant of a tensor with an upper and lower index is an invariant expression. Well, again, this expression yields exactly the same value as this one. So this gives us the, the means of determining the Gaussian curvature directly from our curvature tensor simply by taking its determinant. Well, what about the principal curvatures? Well, we said that in this case, in the previous video, that if these uh, mixed partials are zeros, then our principal curvatures are just these diagonal elements. So uh, we'd say that the trace is nothing but the sum of these two terms, which they would be uh, kappa 1 and kappa 2. And down here, because these mixed partials are zero, this term drops out. And our determinant, which is the Gaussian curvature, is just the product of our principal curvatures. All right, well, the same is true over here with our curvature tensor. If we're fortunate enough to see this as a diagonal matrix, has only diagonal elements, and these off-diagonal terms are zero, then this term and this term will be our principal curvatures. And again, we can say that this is equal to kappa 1 plus kappa 2. And down here, because these would be 0, this drops out. And this is the product of kappa 1 times kappa 2. 
All right, well, what if this is not the case? What if uh, these terms are not zero? Well, in this case, we simply rotate the coordinate axes until they become zero, and then that will give us the principal curvatures directly. Well, in this case, we have to perform the logical equivalent of that, which is an operation known as diagonalizing the matrix. But that's a topic we're going to save for the next video. Right now, what we're going to do is take a break and review what we've covered so far. The first thing we did was to show that the Laplacian of our position vector yields this invariant expression. We know it's invariant because of the full contraction of the indexes. And we call this thing the curvature normal. And what it tells us is that the curvature information about our surface is related to our position vector by means of a second order derivative operation. Well, we then played upon this idea to come up with an explicit expression for the components of our curvature tensor. We showed that these four components are derived simply by forming all the possible combinations of the ways in which we can apply the covariate derivative twice with respect to our position vector. We then showed that our curvature tensor with one upper and one lower index can be used to determine the various invariant curvature properties of our surface. For example, the mean curvature of the surface is simply going to be the full contraction of our uh, curvature tensor. The sum of the diagonal elements of our curvature tensor will yield the mean curvature. That's the equivalent of adding together the two principal curvatures. Well, in a similar fashion, the Gaussian curvature can be derived by simply finding the determinant of our curvature tensor. And uh, that's represented by the letter kappa and is also the equivalent of the product of our two principal curvatures. In the next video, we'll continue on to show how we can use the curvature tensor to derive specific values for the principal curvatures.